consider the idea that the peoples of this world will be won by anything other than preaching. The verb preach comes from the Greek word kerisso, and it means the verbal announcing, the spoken proclamation, the audible hearing of a message. Send me. I'm here, our prayers, our finances, our mission, our action must prioritize the proclamation of the gospel amongst the unreached. 6,500 unreached people groups, 2 billion people who have not heard the gospel. And the unreached are blind because the church is mute. We must surrender our words and our lack of them for the gospel must be preached to every people. gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world amongst every unreached people as a witness and then the end will come that the generosity of God would flow to the people of God for the mission of God that the generosity of God would flow to the people of God for the mission of God we're ending our generosity series today and briefly looking back on the last month, we've looked at some great principles. We've looked at spirit-led giving. We've looked at the Lord's tithe. We've looked at that generosity should mark the people of God. But this morning, we're going to be looking at the, the principle that generosity should flow to the people of God for the mission of God. We're going to be looking at missions this morning. So go out, go ahead and take out a missionary book, the Holy Bible, and open to Genesis in the 24th chapter, the first book of Moses. To understand where we are in this story, this is the story of God's promise to the father of the faithful, Abraham. God chose Abraham not for himself and not for his own people, but God chose Abraham to be a blessing to all nations, that through Abraham, all nations, all people, and all tribes would be blessed, that the Father's blessing would flow through his people to his mission. We're going to be reading the 24th chapter. So let's go ahead, and I'll go ahead and get started. Now, Abraham was old. Well, amen. God can use you no matter what age you are, Amen. Yeah, some people, you know, I, I'm reminded of Leonard Ravenhill when he said that there's no retirement in Christianity on this side of eternity. We all have a part to play in the mission of God until we see him face to face. Abraham was old and well advanced, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Amen. That's something to look forward to. So Abraham said to his oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand upon my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughter of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now, that's an interesting way to make a promise, isn't it? Isn't that an interesting moment? To, you know, like we know in court, in court, you know, you raise your right hand. Well, this is interesting. Reach up and touch the thigh of Abraham? Everyone turn to your neighbor and give an Abrahamic blessing. I'm just kidding. You know, you know, calm down. But this is an interesting moment. It, 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 it bases its roots of a sacred promise, a holy oath. It's the basis of where we get testimony or testify is this promise. But it's, it's, this, is, this is such a significant event because Abraham is saying, I'm trusting you, my servant Eliezer, with everything I have. Everything I have. All my wealth, all of my inheritance, all of my camels and my sheeps and my goats and my oxen. Camels. 
Well, that reminds me of a story. So there I was. I was in Saudi Arabia. I was a young missionary. I was being sent out. This is a mission sermon. I'll go ahead and tell you a mission story. And it's about camels in the desert. What do you know? And so, I, you know, I was sent out. I was young. I was on fire for the things of God. I had the Holy Ghost and zero dollars in my bank account. I had dreadlocks and flip-flops and a King James Bible. And somebody hands me tickets to go to Saudi Arabia. And I go, yeah, because that's where you go when you're on fire for the things of God. And so I got on an airplane, and we went to Saudi Arabia, and, we, and I did everything wrong. I broke every missions rule under the planet. And here I am preaching and teaching and ministering and going into the mosques and telling them that Jesus is the risen Son of God because you're okay, right? you got love in your heart. You're blessed. And so, and so then all of a sudden, on this trip, I find myself on a camel because that's Saudi Arabia. And, yeah, there it is. I'm on a camel. But if you don't know, notice one thing. You don't ever see camels in like the kids' petting zoos. There's a reason. Camels are mean. Camels are terrifying. Camels are like demon horses. And so I get on this, and you know, I, to, you know in respect of the camel, I realize that I am like, you know, I, I'm a larger man. I am not little, you know, I don't wear, I've never worn a medium-sized t-shirt. And so, and I'm looking, you know, I'm, I'm not a one-hump camel guy. I'm a two-hump camel guy. And so I'm looking for the big camel, and there is no big camel. And so I start, and all these little Arab guys, they're all small, and, and they're all laughing at me because I'm struggling to get on this camel. And because of my size, this camel's not having it. Like, this is a bad day. And did you know that a camel can turn its head at 360 degrees? And I learned all of these interesting facts right before I get on a camel. He's like, watch out for their teeth, Kyle. And I'm like, what, Bert? And my friend Bert, he's like, watch out for their teeth. They've been known to bite men's shoulder sockets and pull them out and throw them. A grown camel can pick you up and throw you. I had no idea. And I'm like, okay. I love you, Jesus. And then I learned that you're supposed to have a stick. You know, spare the rod, spoil the camel. Like, you're supposed to, you know, basically control the camel in its submission. And you're supposed to hit it if it oh, disobeys. And I'm learning all of this in this 10-second window before I get on the camel. And so then I get on the camel. And he, it's like every demon in all of the Arabian Peninsula just began to manifest in the camel. And now he's like roaring and spitting on me and trying to bite me. And I'm literally getting in a fist fight on a mission trip with a camel. And it's trying to get me and it's growling. And I'm terrified. And it was at this moment. It was at this moment that I realized the generosity of God. We all drove cars to get here. All of us got in our cars and we're worried about our engine lights or our low tire pressure because it's cold. You didn't have to deal with a camel. All these traveling trips in the Bible where they traveled over long distances, they had to deal with these beasts. Let's go back to this story, the story of Abraham and his servant Eliezer when they're traveling on these camels long distances. Let's, let's continue. Verse 4, but you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife from my son Isaac. Did you catch that? The whole point of this story, the father is sending Eliezer, the helper, to get a bride for his son. Now, wait a second. The father is sending a helper to get a bride for his son? And it just so happens this son was birthed miraculously? Maybe you sound like you've heard this story before. And that is God's majesty as he always tells the story before the story. A great a, a theologian once said that the, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. But the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And that's what we have here. We have the story before the story. We have the father sending the Sending the helper to get a bride for his son. And isn't that the mission of God? That the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, is right now bringing forth a bride on the earth for the son, Jesus Christ. 
a bride from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And that's the blessing of Abraham. Not that he would just contain it for his own household, but that he would be a blessing to all nations. That every tribe would be blessed. That every tongue would be blessed. That every people group on the earth would receive the blessing of Abraham by faith. And that's the gospel. So the story continues. And one one part I like to focus on To your descendants, in verse 6, I give this land. He will send an angel before you. He's speaking to Eliezer about how this mission is going to be accomplished. And you will take a wife from my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from there. And if the woman, and, and you will be released from there. So the servant put his hand upon his thigh. Once again, this testimony, this sacred oath of his master Abraham, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels, dear Lord, he had to have faith to go with ten camels, and departed with all of his master's goods. Did you catch that? All of his master's goods were in his hand. The fa- That's what I noticed. I noticed. The mission of God, you have the provision of the Father. If you're on the mission of God, you have the provision of the Father. Some of you, some of you are like, man, you're always looking at your accounts and you're always in a season of lack and it's never, you're never in a season of abundance. Is it possible you're not on mission? Is it possible that you've stepped away from the mission of God? Because this story teaches that if you're in the mission of God, you have the Father's provision. A great missionary once said, God's work done God's way will not lack God's supply. Evaluate yourself whether you are on the mission of God. Are you experiencing the generosity of God? Well, the generosity flows into his mission. Let's get on mission for the things of God. And that's okay. Because this is Mission City USA. Did you know that? That this city was birthed on the concept of mission? This is Mission City. This is Military City. Remember who you are. Remember what you're called to do. Military city, mission city. Let's continue. My favorite part, verse, my favorite part, verse 43. This is when, this is when the wife, the soon to be wife, begins to be abundantly crazy generosity. She begins to be crazy generous. When, when Eliezer comes on the scene, with his camels, not only does she offer water, if you know the story, what does she want to do? She wants to water all of his camels. And it was by this act of service that the generosity came to her and came to her families, 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 families throughout the line of her that to this day, over 2,000 years, 4,000 years, were telling this story because she was willing to serve. This miracle flowed through her willing to serve. And, and, and honestly, it would be a great disgrace for the daughter of a patriarch, for the daughter of, of a tribesman. This was a role for a servant, not for a daughter of the house. But she was willing to humble herself and serve. And not only serve, but get, not only get water for, for the Eliezer, the helper, for, for the camels. Have you ever seen camels drink in the desert? It's not a quick thing. They take their time. She extravagantly served and the generosity of God flowed into her life and to her children's children's children to where thousands of years we're talking about it right now. She opened up the house, come and rest that there might be lodging for you as well. And then when Eliezer, the helper, saw the heart of the soon-to-be bride, he knew that God was faithful to his promise and he says this, I bowed my head and I worshiped the Lord. And I bless the Lord God of my master Abraham who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. This is the story before the story. This is the mission of God. They continue, all of a sudden there's a table. There's a meal. There's bread. 
and there's wine, and Eliezer, the helper, is there doing the bit of the, of the father, and the soon-to-be bride is there, and Eliezer says, I, I, I'm not to eat until I tell you my task, until I tell you my errand, until I tell you my mission, what, what I'm called to do by my father. I, I'm here to get a bride, and I'm willing to pay any price for the bride. Then there's an interesting part of the story. There's foot washing. Hello. Wait a second. Now, many of us will miss this. But remember, God always tells the story before telling the story. Can you remember another time with a table, bread, wine, foot washing, and a commandment about a mission? Talking about a helper. Jesus at the last supper with his disciples. The last night he was on the earth. He took up bread and he broke it saying, this is my body which is broken for you. He raised the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant which is shed for the forgiveness and powerful removal of sins. He took a towel around his waist and he began to wash his disciples' feet. And Peter said, no, not my feet. And said, Peter said, Peter, if, I don't, if you don't let me wash your feet, you don't understand my teaching. Well, wash my head, Jesus. You see, it was on this moment that Jesus says a new commandment I write to you, love one another. We have a table, we have a cup, we have a bread, we have a foot washing, we have a commandment. God always tells the story before telling the story. It's the same God. The God of Abraham is the God of Isaac, who is the God of Jacob, who came to us in the form of Jesus Christ. He is the revelation of God on the earth. But where are you? And his mission. Where are you, Mission City? Where are you, Military City? Can I speak to you, Military City USA, about your commander in chief? Have you forgotten the great mission of God? Where are you in the great campaign for souls that's coming to its exciting end right before us in these last days? Where are you in the mission of God? Have you forgotten the great mission? good guy. It's like 200, 100, I don't know. My dog always ate scraps when I was a kid. I don't even know what this is. This has to be expensive. It has a wolf on it. Y'all laughing. Americans, Americans, the most blessed nation on the earth, you spend more money on dog food than you do on missions. On average, the American family spends more money feeding their dogs than reaching people for the mission of God. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of the story with Jesus with a Syrophoenician woman. His disciples said, oh, don't don't minister to her. She's an outsider. And she begs Jesus, even even the dogs deserve the scraps from the master's table. But you don't bring your scraps to King Jesus. Far too long, we've been given our scraps to the great mission of God. On average, the American Christian gives one penny a day to reach unreached people groups. I believe the Holy Spirit would say to us this afternoon, keep the change. Keep the change. I speak this way 
sharply and directly because I want us all to evaluate ourselves on where we are in the mission of God. It's so easy to forget and be distracted by our culture. It's so easy to keep scrolling and keep watching. It's so easy to be perplexed and enchanted and lulled asleep by our culture. In fact, the church is not immune from this attack because I know this great truth. Either the church goes into the world or the world comes into the church. Either the church goes into the world on the great mission of God or guess what happens? Nature abhors a vacuum. Either we go into the world or the world comes inside here. And in the last 200 years, the church has been infiltrated and attacked by the world. Our standards of morality have been surrendered. I heard last, this morning that someone, it's like, it's like our backbone has fallen out. But there's still hope for the church of God. And it's found in this book. And it's found by taking heed according to the commandments of our great commander-in-chief. His mission remains... I'm reminded of a great illustration by Warren Webster. In 1967, during the last great war on the Gold Coast of Africa, there lived an elderly man. He had honorably served His Majesty's government and had been given a small pension in which he wanted to retire in the hills and farm his land and plant his corn. One day while he was working in the fields, he heard a message come by drumbeat, drumbeat across the jungle forest floor. He stopped to listen, and he translated the message to himself. He learned that a great war had begun, and that his majesty's government was in trouble, and it needed help. About a week later, in a small little post office on the coast, the postmaster processed a dirty, small little letter on which an eloquent message was written. Your majesty, I'm coming. Your majesty, I am coming. Have we forgotten that we are in a great war for the souls of mankind? Have we forgotten that our great commander-in-chief, Jesus, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, has called for our aid in the great campaign for souls? Now, Christians are obsessed with their individual calls. I did a decade of college ministry. I'm called to do this, and I'm called to do that. I'm called, I'm called. And all the Christians would always talk about their calling in an individual sense. Your individual sense, your individual call, it must line up with the, our collective call. Your individual call must line up for our collective call. Notice how you never hear someone say, I'm called to make disciples. I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm called to make disciples and preach the gospels in another nation. Our individual call must line up with our collective call. And, and most people, when they think about missions, they always think of it as like an epic step, right? It's an epic step to take everything you own, sell it, and say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a place and live my life and preach the gospel and learn another language and, and be in a different culture. And I'm not going to have holidays with my families and I'm going to have to itinerate and raise money and quit my job. Does that sound like an epic step? It does. Every single missionary that I've ever spoken to, do you know how they got on the mission field? It wasn't through an epic step. It was through a next step. Stop thinking of it as leaps of faith, but rather small steps of obedience. Mount Everest is 58,000 steps. When they ask every single person who's ever been to the top of Mount Everest, do you know what they say? I just kept walking. I just kept taking one step in front of the next. One simple step of obedience. Not a leap of faith. Not a leap of faith. And what's interesting is your next step is just as epic as the next. One simple faith step towards God. I'm reminded, what's the most famous step in our history? 
both in a people and as a nation. Does anyone know? Come on. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You know the step. You know, was it a big significant step? You know, from, from the lunar module, from the Apollo mission to the, earth, to the moon, how, how far was it? 12 inches? Maybe two feet? Was that epic? No. How many steps were there? How many faithful steps were there to get to that moment? Let's look at some of them on Armstrong's career. He possessed a master's degree in the STEM field in engineering and biological science. He had 1,000 hours in pilot command on jet aircraft. He passed the, the NASA long-duration flight physical. He had two master's degrees, 36 semester hours, two years of quarter hours on 54 hours total for his doctrinal program in related sciences and engineering. He had to complete a medical doctorate of osteopathic medicine and to be recognized in a test pilot program. One small step. Some of you are like, I'm just trying to get through this semester. <laughs> One small step in front of another. The Bible says, therefore, brothers, be diligent rather to make your calling and election sure. For practicing these things, never at any time shall you stumble. What's your next step for God? What's your next step? I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to equip you for your ministry. Every one of you has a ministry. Every one of you has a ministry that you've been granted by Jesus Christ. And I'm here to equip you on, on what we call the strategy of our church. We have a strategy. It's not just haphazard. We have a specific strategy in, we, in which we want to help you become devoted followers of Jesus. That is our collective call. And so when we look at our collective call and our collective strategy, you might ask, what is our strategy? Well, we call it the six B's. Let me explain it to you. Number one is we want you to be invited. You're all here because you were invited, whether you saw us online or saw us through a friend. You know, you know most people will come to church if you invite them, a.k.a. secret of church growth right there. It's not a hard thing. Invite your friends, and then they come, and then you get tacos, and you're blessed. It's a simple thing. Be invited. You know, it's the first thing Jesus, the rabbi, did with his disciples. Rabbi, where do you live? Well, come over. Come and see. Invitation is right there at the heart of the kingdom. It's the start. Come and see. Be invited is our first B. The second one is to belong to a small group. Most people, they want to belong before they believe. They want to test you to see if you're real or if you're fake. You know, community is stronger than argument. Community is stronger than uh, preaching. I'm grateful that in our church, our family's meeting in over 140 different houses throughout the week. That's stronger. COVID has proven that when we couldn't all be together and when we couldn't all be safe. Do you know how our church not only grew but planted churches? Because we belong to a small group. We belong to a small group. My life was changed because of small groups. I was discipled in small groups. Then what happens when you belong to a small group? You're united to a community, but ultimately the most important thing is you're united to Christ. That we see Christ in one another, and then all of a sudden, you be I believe. And you come into the faith, you come into community, and we celebrate that through water baptism. You repent, and you turn from your sins in your old life, and you say, I want to follow Jesus. And you express that through water baptism. And that is the greatest celebration that we have. It's such an exciting time to see new birth and new life. So we're invited. We belong. We believe and we're baptized. But then guess what? Newsflash. Christianity. It's not about you. It's not. It's not about you. Everyone goes, self-help books. Throw them all away. Help others. 
help others. The Bible says, he who waters others is himself watered. The, 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 as, a, as a psychology major, one of the greatest things that they teach you is that in order to get yourself in a proper state of mental health, begin to serve and help other people. Get your focus off yourself. And, but Christians are obsessed. Well, how am I doing? How's my walk with God? How's my devotional life? Who cares? Focus on someone else. You'll be okay. In fact, I've always seen that switch. Whenever you make that turn and you get your eyes off yourself, it's like you move from someone drowning, you're now the lifeguard. Well, guess what? The lifeguard's not worried about drowning. And that's the greatest turn that you can do. In fact, this the Bible says, this is how we know we pass from death to life, that we love one another. We get our focus off of ourselves, and guess what happens? You begin to serve. You begin to help. The helper comes inside of your heart by faith, and you begin to transform your life. It's not about yourself. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And then you have this great hunger and desire and a humility to be trained. And we want to train you and equip you for what God's called you to do. And we do that in H300 and in, and in DTC, and we do that in, in GSM. We want to equip you for your calling. Not so that you could be cogs in this machine, but that rather that God would produce fruit in your house and in your life and in your families and in your workplaces. And then finally, the last part of our strategy, the last B, is to be sent. What does it look like to be sent? Well, some are sent to plant churches. Some are sent to start small groups. And what's crazy is, you know what happens when you start a healthy small group? It turns into a church. That's what happened in Kerrville. Oscar just went. He just was trained, and then he started a small group, and then it exploded. And then there were just people everywhere. And so what did they have to do? They started a church. All because of a simple next step. It wasn't epic. It was faithful. God is looking for faithful next steps. So let's, let's, let's do something. You guys want to have like a, a practical exercise I think would be helpful for everyone to find out what their next step is? We're going to go. It's really, a, it's really important to look where you want to go. That's really important. And, and as, a, as a family, we need to know where we're going. We need to know what it means to be sent. If that's our destination, well, to be sent means you're, you have started a small group. You have started your own small group. You have been sent out to plant a church. You have been sent out to serve. And if that's you right now, if that's you, go ahead and, no, go ahead and stand up. If that's you right now, if you've been sent out and you are currently a small group leader or a house leader or you're currently a, a, a pastor, if that's you, go ahead and stand praise God. If, if right now, if, if right now you're in training, if right now you're in training, whether you're being trained to be a small group leader or you're in GSM, you're being trained in DTC, if that's you right now, or you're being trained in velocity, go ahead and stand up. Go ahead and stand up if that's you, if you're being training. All right. Now, right now, if you're currently a volunteer, if you're currently a volunteer in our church family and you're serving in any capacity on a Sunday morning, if you're, if you're a volunteer, our volunteers, go ahead and stand up. Remain, everybody remain standing. Everybody remains. If, thank you for serving. Thank you. All right. If you've just believed and be back, if you're just believed and you're like, I was just baptized, I got my, you know, I'm, a, I'm on cloud nine. If that's you, everybody just remain standing. If you're just believed, go ahead and stand up. All right. I'll praise God. And this is where everyone stands up. If somehow you got in this room and you were invited, that's great. We're glad you're here. Welcome home. But if you're invited and somehow you got here, go ahead. Everyone should be standing. You're like, I wasn't invited. I just walked in. No, everybody's invited. You know. But the, the reason we're doing this, the reason we're doing this is we want everyone to know what their next step is. This is our strategy. We desperately want to help you become devoted followers of Jesus. And this is done through this strategy. We've seen God do this time and time again. Not the epic step, the next step. So how? It's very simply, if you want to know what your next step is, if you're, if you're new, you need to belong to a small group. You need to belong to a small group. If you're in a small group and you don't know who Jesus is, we call you to repent and believe the gospel. We would love to give you a Bible and make sure your small group leader is meeting with you twice a month. We want them to meet with you. 
If you've been baptized and you believe, it's time for you to serve the mission of God. If you're currently serving, you need to have that conversation with your small group leader. You think I'm ready to start a small group? The greatest privilege you can ever do is take spiritual responsibility for others. Am I ready? And have that conversation. If you're being trained, you're processing, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to serve? Do you want me to plant a church? Do you want me to start a small group in a new city? Do you want me to start a small group at work? And if you're sent, your job is to train others to do the same. How do we do this? How do we move to the next step practically? Well, you can go to mygateway.tv slash connect. And we'll have a link for you on the screen. So everyone can know their next step in the mission of God. But in closing, I want to tell you something that's so important. And if you don't remember anything, remember this, what I say right now. This strategy, it's not about you. This strategy, it's not about you. It's not about your health. It's not about your spiritual walk. It's not about your spiritual condition. This strategy is so that Jesus would receive glory and honor from a devoted follower. The, the attitude of heaven in, in Revelation 7, and if you know it, we're going to put it on the screen. Amen. Blessing and honor, glory, wisdom, and thanksgiving, and power and might be unto God forever. Amen. That is the heart of our church, that Jesus would receive glory from your life, and he receives glory when you are a devoted follower of him. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, Jesus, that you would receive glory from every tribe, tongue, and nation. That what you're doing here in this church and in all of our campus, this is all across the state of Texas, God, that you would show everyone in this room what their next step is. Just as 4,000 years ago, you showed Abraham in Iraq his next step, God, you would show us our next step our next faithful step. That the sons and daughters of God would walk in faith. That they would look unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith. Amen. Amen.